But let's talk about all the events of the weekend. Sarah Everard and the vigil and the policing and uh, people calling for Cressida Dick's uh, head and, uh, of course, the Prime Minister chairing a meeting of the Crime and Justice Task Force this morning. Everyone is so concerned about the policing of that lockdown, sorry, of that protest, and yet we didn't hear the same concerns over all the policing of the lockdown protests over the last year. Let's talk to Toby Young, who's General Secretary of the Free Speech Union. Good morning to you, Toby. Good morning, Julia. I mean, I'm noticing you from your tweets over the weekend. You had exactly the same reaction I did. Uh, just really just quite bemused at all the people who suddenly have discovered that um, they have been supporting laws for the last year, uh, which allowed for the policing of protests in just the way that they were carried out on Saturday night. It was extraordinary. It was like um, everyone sounding like Captain Renault in Casablanca. People were shocked, shocked to discover that... Um, we live in an authoritarian society in which protests are no longer allowed or even vigils. Um, it, it's just as you say, um, people who uh, made not a squeak of noise when anti-lockdown protesters were treated in exactly the same way last September, for instance, when there was a peaceful protest in Trafalgar Square. Um, the What looked like the, the territorial support group, the paramilitary wing of the Metropolitan Police went in mob-handed um, uh, and brutally dispersed that demonstration last September. People like you and I complained, Julia, uh, about that treatment um, uh, because it was clearly a breach of, a, of a, an essential civil liberty in any democratic society. But most of the people who were complaining about the police's behaviour on Saturday night welcomed the dispersal of those anti-lockdown protesters, uh, dismissed them as COVID deniers and conspiracy theorists, said they posed a danger to the public, even though all the evidence suggests that outdoor protests uh, don't contribute to the transmission of COVID-19 in any way. Even Sir Patrick Vallance has said that there was no uptick in infections after the BLM protests that the police uh, allowed to go ahead um, last year. Um, uh, but people, the people condemning the police on Saturday night um, uh, welcomed the police's brutal dispersion of anti-lockdown protesters on several occasions in London. Uh, and then suddenly, because it was a cause they sympathised with, they were shocked, shocked yes. to discover that the police behave in such a heavy handed way. And this is the interesting thing, people. because just like freedom of speech, and the people who say I support freedom of speech, but um, people who say they support you know, freedom of protest, they support freedom of protest, but and the reality is, unless you support these freedoms for people for whom you don't agree, people you might despise, you might dislike, you might think they're fundamentally wrong, unless you support their freedoms as well, you don't actually support those freedoms. It, it is extraordinary, particularly when you have that Jess Phillips, the Labour MP who has campaigned, does some great work on campaigning against violence against women and domestic abuse and the like. But she was on, on telly yesterday morning sort of talking about her horror that such authoritarian police response. She voted. She as a Labour MP voted for those very laws that were used against protesters on Saturday night. Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, the Prime Minister himself, they brought in those laws and now they're absolutely horrified they're being used. Yeah, it, 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 it is extraordinary. I mean, this is the other point um, that uh, the reason the police behaved as they did um, is because they've essentially been tasked by Parliament uh, in enforcing the lockdown regulations uh, which prevent peaceful protest. Our civil liberties have been suspended. I mean, it is extraordinary, as you say, for all these senior politicians who've been enthusiastically supporting the lockdown, who've endorsed this suspension of our ancient liberties uh, from day one, suddenly, because uh, they see a group of people who the, the, can command public sympathy and who they feel it's politic to sympathise with themselves, suddenly they're, they're shocked, shocked that the police are actually enforcing the rules they've just voted for. I think the, the, the biscuit must go to Sadiq Khan. Because not only has he been one of the most enthusiastic cheerleaders for the draconian lockdown regulations, but he himself has to endorse senior operational decisions made by the Metropolitan Police. It beggars belief that he wasn't consulted about the police's um, uh, dispersal of this vigil before it actually happened. And yet he expressed shock that it was happening and said there would need to be an inquiry into how this had come about. What's he going to do? Inquire into himself? It was completely ludicrous. The buck stops with him in London. He bears responsibility for what happened. It's not Cressida Dick 
who should resign. It's Sadiq Khan. But do you think that actually all the talk about whether Chris Sadiq should resign or Sadiq Khan and whose responsibility it is, that actually that it kind of ignores the real issue? And actually the real issue is the fact that why are we having a situation when a year on from the pandemic start is we still have that emergency legislation in place? Question marks of whether it should be brought in in the first place. But with all the evidence we now have after last summer, that there is no good health reason uh, to ban those protests um, and, and, and that it's perfectly safe for people to protest, that we that we shouldn't have a law in existence, which, by the way, next week is all undoubtedly going to be renewed again, which bans people from exercising their most fundamental civil liberties. Absolutely. Um, I, I've thought from day one that the suspension of liberties like the right to protest has been wrong. Uh, whenever a government um, uh, is thinking about doing something as extreme as that, as anti-democratic as that, it has to have a really good reason for doing so. The burden of proof rests with the state if it wants to withdraw our liberties. It doesn't fall on us to defend them. The state has to have a really good reason and its reason in this case was that unless supposedly, unless we withdraw these civil liberties, unless we effectively imprison people in their homes, then people will die. Uh, this measure is necessary to prevent harm. I think we now know uh, from an overwhelming amount of evidence that those measures weren't necessary in order to prevent harm. Uh, if we look at Sweden, where civil liberties weren't suspended last year, the number of people who've died from COVID-19 per million is lower than it is in the UK. Even if you look at overall all-cause all excess mortality in Sweden, it's lower than overall excess mortality in the UK. Those US states that haven't imposed, that didn't impose a lockdown last winter, I think there are nine US states that didn't lock down last winter. The average number of COVID deaths per million in those US states is lower than it is in those US states that did lockdown last winter. Indeed. We can see in Florida, where cases are falling in the same way that they are in those states that did lock down last winter, that the absence of a lockdown has not contributed to a yeah. higher but, but, death but toll. But Toby, you've got to see, keep, stop focusing on data rather than dates because uh, uh, because the data apparently doesn't, doesn't really uh, uh, have any effect on these things. 